Hi everyone, thank you for joining me here virtually at SQL Bits from wherever you are in the world. My name's Paul Randall and I'm recording this here in my sign booth in Redmond, Washington. Let's get to the session and don't forget that I'm on the chat live to answer any questions you might have. So this session is Introduction to Performance Troubleshooting Using Weight Statistics, one of my favorite things to talk about. As I said, my name's Paul Randall, very quick introduction because we don't have very much time. Um, I'm co-owner of SQLSkills.com with my lovely wife, Kimberly. Uh, there's my email address there, there's my blog link, my Twitter link. I used to work for Microsoft on the storage engine team for about nine years, wrote a whole bunch of the code, including DBCC CheckDB, and then ended up responsible for the whole of the storage engine. Uh, a few more links there about uh, training that we do and consulting that we do and our newsletter that comes out every couple of weeks. Anyway, on to the good stuff. So very commonly, I see what I call knee-jerk performance tuning, where somebody jumps to a conclusion based on some things that they see, some symptoms that they see, and they think, ah, that must be the actual problem. And they go down a path of troubleshooting and they end up wasting a whole bunch of time. One of the best ways to start any kind of performance tuning is to look at weight statistics. SQL Server is keeping track of why threads are having to wait, and you can interpret that information pretty easily most of the time and get an idea of where to go digging further for troubleshooting. But you have to have some practice. So what we're going to cover is kind of an introduction to weight statistics. I'll talk about how the thread lifecycle works. We'll talk about what weights are, what the various uh, nomenclature words that describe weights are. I'll introduce you to the two DMVs that you can use, the two main DMVs, and we'll look at some common weight types, and I'll do a couple of demos for you. So interpreting the weight statistics data, as I said, don't do knee-jerk performance troubleshooting. Okay, work through the data that you've got in front of you to try to decide what the root cause is, because it might not be an obvious thing based on the symptoms. So using weight statistics, as I said, it takes some practice. You have to know, first of all, how to get the data back correctly, and I'm going to show you how to do that. You have to understand what some of the common weight types that you're going to see over and over and over again mean, and I'm going to tell you about some of those. I also have a weights library that I have a link to at the end of the deck that's going to show you what all the various weight types, the common weight types mean. You've got to be able to recognize some patterns, and I'm going to tell you about some of the various patterns that you're going to see as well. Avoiding inappropriate internet advice. There's all kinds of information out there on the internet, and just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's correct. Somebody may have posted something, and it might actually be incorrect. So make sure you're getting your information on the internet from a trusted source. And then practice, 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 practice. Now, you could just walk up to a SQL server and ask for weight statistics. But what's much better, especially if it's a server that you're managing, is to have a series of snapshots of weight statistics over time. So if a problem happens, you can go back and do some kind of time series analysis and figure out what might have gone wrong. If, you're, if you have any kind of third-party performance monitoring tool, they're all going to capture weight statistics for you and provide some kind of analysis. So what are weights? A wait means that a thread is executing SQL Server code and it needs a resource that it cannot get and so it has to stop and wait for that resource to become available. Now when the thread stops and waits, SQL Server keeps track of the fact that the thread stopped and it makes a note of what the thread is actually waiting for and these are the wait types that we are going to examine. So a few simple examples of resources that may be unavailable that a thread would have to stop and wait for. Imagine it needs uh, a lock. So where I've got there, it says LCK underscore M underscore XX. Anytime you see XX in this deck, it means that could be a number of different things. Like it could be um, lock mode S for share or X for, X for exclusive or IX for intent exclusive. So a thread needs to get a lock, and it can't because some other thread has an incompatible lock already. Maybe we want to get an S lock on a row to read it, and somebody's already updating the row, so there's an X lock on the row. Our thread's going to have to wait until the updating thread's transaction commits, its locks are dropped, and then it can hopefully get that share lock. If a thread needs a page to read something from. It's going to make a call into the buffer pool, it's running buffer pool code, and it looks to see if the page is already in memory. If the page is not already in memory, it has to issue a physical I.O., and then it stops and it waits for the I.O. to complete. And then you'd see a page I.O. latch underscore either S.H. or E.X. most commonly, wait type. Parallelism, I'm going to explain what the C.X. packet wait means, and the Threads in a parallel query can sometimes have to wait for other threads to give them some information, and so you'll see CX packet waits. And then going a little bit deeper, every data structure in SQL Server is protected by a, a mechanism called a latch. You can kind of think of it as a kind of mutual exclusion 
way of dealing with multi multi-threaded access to a data structure. For instance, one thread cannot be reading a data structure while another thread is altering it, for instance. I mean, that's kind of obvious because then you might get all kinds of weird information coming back. So latches are a little bit deeper. Um, I do have a lot of information that, that I'll point you to in references on my blog and so on that I've, I've written about latches, but we're just going to cover weights here. So thread scheduling. SQL Server does its own thread scheduling, and this means that the operating system, either Windows or, or Linux, can't tell SQL Server what to do. And this is called non-preemptive scheduling. Now, obviously, it's running inside the context of the operating system, but I always tell people when you're thinking about how SQL Server does its scheduling, ignore the operating system. Okay, it's way easier just to take the operating system out of your head. And this is done by the SQL OS layer of the storage engine. So non-preemptive scheduling, except when a thread has to call out to the OS, and then it has to relinquish control to the operating system, and that's called preemptive mode. Okay. Now, each processor core has a scheduler, simplifying things. For instance, the laptop I'm recording this on has four physical cores. I've got hyper-threading enabled, so there is eight logical cores available for a SQL Server to, to use. So there are eight schedulers that are on this instance of SQL Server to be able to run my queries. There are some other schedulers that are there for kind of background tasks and so on, but the, the eight schedulers that I have are going to be running my query. And then the threads that I need for that query are going to be taken from the thread pool and distributed amongst the schedulers, and they run my query. When SQL Server first starts up, it creates a certain number of threads. There is a maximum number of threads for a particular instance based on the number of cores and so on. It doesn't create the maximum number of threads straight away. The thread pool where these threads live will grow and shrink dynamically over time. Okay. So threads are taken from the thread pool or they're created if there, there's not enough threads available. And then they run the query, they go back in the thread pool, and then they might end up being destroyed at some later time if the thread pool shrinks. You can use the DMV DMOS schedulers to look and see what schedulers you have as well. So the basic components of a scheduler. There's the processor. Only one thread is running at a time on the processor, and this is really the, the logical core. There's the waiter list, which is all the threads that are waiting for a particular resource. And then there's the runnable queue. And the runnable queue is all the threads that have been waiting for a resource. They've been told their resource is available, and they're just waiting to get back up onto the processor. Now, in reality, the waiter list and the runnable queue, it's really just one list of threads, and they have different statuses. But it helps humans to kind of visualize this graphically. So when threads are first put onto the scheduler to start a query, they're immediately runnable. And so they're put onto the runnable queue. And the threads go round and round and round this loop until they finish processing the query. So the various thread states. A thread can be in one of these three states. It's running, in other words, it's actually on the processor. It's suspended, which means it's on the waiter list, or it's runnable. And so threads transition round and round going through these various states until the work is complete. And then they go back into the thread pool. So going from running to suspended. A thread is going along on the processor executing code and it comes across the need for a resource that it can't get. So it, it has to wait. So when that happens, it gets suspended. Okay. It goes off of the processor. This is called the context switch. It goes onto the waiter list and it waits until it is told its resource is available. Going from suspended to running. The thread is told its resource is available. Now in reality, all that means is some other thread goes to the list of threads for that scheduler, marks SPID60 as now it's runnable. It's deemed as being put onto the runnable queue. And this is a process that's called being signaled. It might be done by another thread on this scheduler, or it could be done by another thread on a completely different scheduler that happens to be releasing the resource that our thread needs. For instance, it could be uh, a lock. And so a thread on a completely different scheduler releases that lock comes across to our scheduler and says, okay, SPID60, now you have your lock. Okay. In our case, we're waiting for a page to be read from disk. So another thread on our scheduler is every so often, as it comes off the processor, it's going to help the scheduling system because it's all done by the threads themselves. And it's going to look to see if any IOs have completed on the list of threads in our scheduler that's waiting for an IO. In this case, yes. So it signals SPID60, marking it as now runnable. And that goes to the bottom of the runnable queue. 
it's easy to think of the runnable queue as a first in, first out queue. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but for our purposes it's enough to think about it that a thread comes into the bottom of the queue and eventually it's going to be the one that bubbles up to the top of the queue and then it's going to be the one that gets put on to the scheduler. It's also possible in SQL Server 2019 and onwards that the thread might move to a different scheduler in the same NUMA node. That's a new thing that was added to help with kind of load balancing of the various schedulers within a NUMA node. So thinking about the various wait times that we have, the definition of what waits are. A thread's running and it needs to get suspended. So it goes onto the waiter list. And the waiter list is not ordered in any way like the runnable queue. Any thread at any time could be told that it's, it's resources available. So it sits there on the waiter list being suspended until it gets signaled, and then it moves to the runnable queue. And that time that it's spending on the waiter list is the resource wait time. And this is most often the, the most important thing that we're interested in. How long do threads have to wait for their resources? Now, the thread sits on the runnable queue until it bubbles up to the top of the runnable queue virtually, and then it is running again. And that time on the runnable queue is called the signal wait time, and that's usually very, very tiny. There are some cases where it could be a lot longer than maybe a tenth or less than a tenth of a millisecond, but with the time that we have here, we don't have time to go into those details. But for the majority of the time, the signal wait time is way shorter than the resource wait time. So those two things together equal the wait time. So from a, a thread running on the processor going all the way around the loop to running on the processor again is called the wait time and it has those two components. Now because the resource wait time is generally the major component of the wait time, most people just say wait time and they really mean resource wait time. So I might do that at some point during this session and that's what I mean. If I say wait time I mean the resource wait time. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can see waits happening inside the server. And again, I don't have time to go into all of them in this session. There are two main DMVs that you can use to look and see what's happening in the server in terms of waits. And this one is usually the one I run first, or a script containing this, and I'm going to show you the script in a demo. DMOS waiting tasks. And you can think of that as the what's happening right now view of threads on the server. To be more technically accurate, it's the what's not happening right now, because it's showing you a list of all of the threads that are currently suspended. Okay? And it provides a whole bunch of useful information. I'm not going to walk down this list on the slide because I'd rather show you in a demo in another 10 minutes or so. So demo is waiting tasks, usually the first thing to run when you walk up to a server that's got a performance issue. The second DMV is DMOS wait stats. And this is going to show an aggregated view of all the waits that have happened for all wait types since the server was last started, or you last manually cleared the wait statistics. Because you can clear wait statistics. It's not something you're going to do very often. It's very useful to do when you're showing demos of things. And I'm going to show you how to do that. So this is the what's happened in the past view of the server. And I said earlier on that it's very useful to have a snapshot of the weights every so often, they say maybe every half an hour, because if you think that this DMV is showing you the, the aggregated weight stats since the server started, let's say your server has been up for three months and yesterday you had a period of a couple of hours where something performance wise wasn't running properly. The weights that occurred in those two hours might be completely masked by the millions, billions of waits that occurred over the three months since your server last started. But if you had a snapshot every half an hour of all the waits that have happened since a half an hour ago, you'd be able to see when something anomalous actually happened. Now, as we're looking at waits and examining the various waits that we see from these various scripts, you've got to bear in mind what's relevant. So waits always happen. Doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. There are quite a few waits that are related to background tasks. And if you don't filter them out of the output from DMOS wait stats, they're going to look like they're the most prevalent wait. For instance, lazy writer sleep. There's a background thread called the lazy writer. There might be more than one of them under certain conditions on your server. But anyway, there's a background thread called the lazy writer. And it wakes up every one second and says, is there a pressure on the buffer pool? 
And if the answer is yes, it gets rid of some pages from the buffer pool. It makes some space in the buffer pool. It's called lazy writing. If the answer is no, there's no pressure. It stops and it waits for a timer for a second. So if there's no pressure on the buffer pool, the, that background thread is going to incur a one second long lazy writer sleep wait every one second. And that could show up as the most prevalent wait on your server when you look at wait statistics. But there's nothing really you can do about it. So you should filter that wait out. So you're looking really at the actionable weights, the things that you can do something about. And sometimes there are other weights, and you'll see in my, my code there's a list of like 30, 40 or so, that the absolute vast majority of the time they're benign, they're not a problem. And so it's much easier to filter them out. So you've got your list of weights, and then you identify the top weights, and the script is going to do that for you, and then you kind of drill in from there, interpreting what's going on. Now, one more thing you've got to think about is just because you're getting weights doesn't mean they're a problem because weights always occur. So, for example, imagine that over the course of, say, eight hours, we saw that there were a thousand weights for a Sherlock. Is that a problem? Well, it depends. Okay, my famous catchphrase. If there were 10 million locks acquired altogether and the total wait time was only 50 seconds, then each one of those weights is a tiny fraction of a second. And that's probably not a big red flag that I would jump at as the first thing to look at. But if every one of those waits was 50 seconds, then that's a red flag. If I didn't know anything there that uh, was the characteristics of your server, then I would want to figure out what was going on there. Okay. So back in, oh, when was it? About 2015 or so, I did a survey on my blog and I said, if you run this code and it, what the code did was it would capture all the waits that happened on your server for 24 hours and then it would send them to me. I said, if you do this, then I'll give you some free Pluralsight stuff and I'll also tell you what all your waits mean. And it was a really stupid thing to do because I had about 650 people send me results and it took me about three months of time to reply to everybody. And that was one of the main driving reasons why I put together the weights library with a, with like a thousand different web pages for all the various different weight types and documenting what a bunch of them mean, the common ones mean. Anyway, it, for me, it was useful, even though it was a stupid thing to do. It was useful because I got a lot of interesting information and I'd done a previous survey about five years before, and it was interesting to see how things had changed. Now, not much had changed really, except the OLADB weight had jumped up from being like down at number 10 to being number two. And this was really interesting. And it was interesting because the, the thing that most people think about when, first thing that most people think about when they see OLADB weights is, oh, it must be a linked server problem. Now, do you think that in the five years between 2010 and 2015, thousands and thousands of people across the world suddenly started using linked servers? No, but what did happen in that time period there was a huge proliferation of third-party performance monitoring tools being installed. And most of these tools, if you look at what they're doing under the covers, are running the various DMVs to get information about the server in a loop. And if you look at the definition of most of the DMVs, they are written as select star from open row set name of DMV. And hopefully some of you are going, aha, yes, open row set, that means it's using the OLADB transport. Now, if you have one of these third-party monitoring tools on your system, you might look at your weight statistics and see that you've got hundreds of millions or billions of little tiny OLEDB weights. And that's your monitoring tool running the DMVs in the background. So that's not an issue. Anyway, so here's the list of top weights. And I'd go out on a limb and say this is a kind of statistically valid sample of weights from across the world, because it was just random people, maybe some of you listening in, sending me their weights from workloads running on random instances. And you can see that the, the top weights is the CX packet from Parallelism, then OLEDB, probably from third-party performance monitoring tools, then write log weights, which we're going to talk about, async network IO we're going to talk about, page IO latch we're going to talk about, and the last three we're not going to talk about. The backup IO can commonly happen when you're backing up to a slow IO subsystem. So think about backing up to a tape drive or maybe backing up to a network location. Now backup buffer is where a thread inside backup is waiting for a buffer to become available to write information to, to then write out to disk or tape. So if you've got slow writes happening, in other words, backup IOs, then you're probably also gonna see backup buffer weights as well, especially if you're running a, a parallel backup. Now, SOS scheduler yield is a weird wait type. It's not really a wait. 
what this means is a thread has been running on the processor for what's called the thread quantum, four milliseconds, it's unchangeable. And it checks to see whether it's exceeded that four milliseconds. And if it does, it plays nicely and it voluntarily gets off the processor and goes directly to the runnable queue, even if it's the only thread on the scheduler. That's just how scheduling works inside SQL Server. But the thread comes off the processor and I said that's called a context switch. And when a context switch occurs, a wait type must be registered. And so when a thread voluntarily gets off the processor, it's yielding the processor and there's a special wait type that's registered called SOS scheduler yield. Now there's all kinds of information about that on the internet and it, it, some people say, oh, that's always an issue, you need more CPUs. No, it depends, that could just be part of your workload. So again, don't knee jerk, make sure you investigate what SOS scheduler yield actually means and correlate it with what's happening in your workload. Anyway, let's get on. So looking at some of the actual wait types now. First one, page IO latch underscore XX. And commonly you're gonna see share, which means the page is being read into memory just so it can be read. Or EX means the page is being read into memory so that it can be changed. So if you're seeing lots of page IO latch weights, don't knee jerk and, and think that it's the IO subsystem that has a problem. Because what you really need to step back and say is, why is SQL Server driving so many reads? Did a query plan change, for instance, that was a small targeted index seek and now is doing a large parallel table scan? Right? So uh, correlate this with CX packet weights. So if you're seeing lots of page IO latch share and lots of CX packet weights, that's a, a pattern, a common pattern that suggests a parallel scan. So why are you suddenly doing parallel scans? Right? It could be that uh, non-clustered indexes aren't being used. Maybe a tipping point was reached, for instance, or your statistics are out of date. And so the, the query processor has an, a, a kind of incorrect query plan or an inefficient query plan. It could be that somebody's deployed some code and now what was using a, a non-clustered index can't use it anymore. Maybe somebody's changed the data type and now there's what's called an implicit conversion in your query plan. And when there's an implicit conversion, it can't use non-clustered indexes. Or maybe somebody's implemented some code that does some arithmetic as part of a comparison with a table column and they're doing the arithmetic on the table column rather than the arithmetic on the variable, for instance. And so that again means that it can't use non-clustered indexes. It could also be that there's memory pressure on the buffer pool. So it could be that some other thing inside SQL Server is taking a large amount of memory and that memory is always borrowed or technically it's called stolen from the buffer pool. And so the memory pressure on the buffer pool means the buffer pool is smaller. And so that means it might not be able to hold your regular working set of data file pages in memory. And so it's causing a, a lot more reads. So you might want to look at memory as well. So all kinds of different things that it could be inside SQL Server rather than, oh, your IO subsystem is going slowly. That's the knee jerk reaction. Now it could be the IO subsystem is going slowly, but that's not where I would look first. Now, the next one, page latch. Go back, page IO latch, page latch, page IO latch. In this one, there's no IO. Now the knee jerk reaction people have for this wait type is, oh, it must be the IO subsystem, or we need to add more memory. Now, there's no IO in this name, which means that this is contention for a page that's already in memory. If the XX is share, that means that the page is needing to be read. If it's EX, that means it needs to be changed. It could also be UP as well, which is common to see for some allocation pages, especially in TempDB in older versions. So don't confuse these with anything to do with reading from disk. This is purely in memory contention. So what you're going to do is figure out what the pages are that the thread is waiting for access to. And there's going to be a couple of different patterns that you might see. It could be what's called classic TempDB contention, where you're seeing page latch UP weights on what are called PFS pages, an allocation page that deals with page allocations. And so the, the classic way of working around that is you add more TempDB data files. Uh, it could also be one of the other allocation bitmaps where you have to turn on trace flag at 1118. You don't have to do that from 2016 onwards. Could also be that you're using lots and lots of temp tables in, the, in, a, in a kind of bad way. And so moving away from classic temp table usage in tempdb, maybe moving to in-memory temp tables instead or in-memory tables. 
2019 has a bunch of nice things that were added to help alleviate classic tempdb contention. Sometimes they don't include, they don't take latches even to update some of these uh, pages, these allocation pages. And also the system tables can be in memory in 2019, which further reduces, I mean, in memory tables, which further reduces the need for having latches taken on, on anything in tempdb because in memory tables don't use locks or latches. If it's a regular table, then have a look and see what the structure of that table or index is. It could be that you've got tons of page splits going on. You've got index fragmentation occurring, basically. You've got page splits going on, so there's contention for pages in the index. A very common one, which I'm going to show you in a demo, is what's called an insert hotspot. And this is where you've got, say, a clustered index with an ever-increasing key, and the row is small enough that you can get lots of rows on a page. You've got lots of concurrent inserters generating identity values for the, the leading cluster key, which all put them on the same page. And so you've got lots of threads waiting for exclusive access to a particular page. Only one thread at a time can be inserting into that page because, as I said, it's a data structure. And so there's an exclusive latch protecting that data structure. And so you get this queue of threads waiting to do that. Locking weights. Now, as I said, a lock weight is where a thread is waiting for a lock and it can't be granted that lock because another thread is already holding an incompatible lock. Don't assume that locking is the root cause though. It could be something else. For instance, let's say that you're using database mirroring or an availability group. It could be that there's a, a delay putting the last log block for the transaction over on the mirror or the availability group synchronous secondary. That delay means the transaction takes longer to commit, which means the locks are held longer. And so there could be more blocking that suddenly appears because of something in your environment is slowing down your mirroring or your availability group. So don't just assume that locking is the issue. It could be lock escalation. If you're suddenly seeing uh, lots of threads waiting for all kinds of locks, something could have escalated to an exclusive table lock for instance. So there you might consider you having different indexes involved. You might consider using snapshot isolation so that writers don't block readers and readers don't block writers, different isolation levels and so on and so on. You can also use a script. There's various scripts out there on the internet to look at the blocking chain to see what's the thread that's holding the blocking lock and what is it waiting for? And that's where you might see that it's mirroring or an availability group, for instance, that's slowing things down at the, the root cause. You could also use a thing called the block process report to capture information when locks are being waited for for a large number of seconds. And there's a guy called Michael Swart in the community who's written a blog post about how to go and use that at that link there. So now let's look at an actual demo of using these various DMVs. A couple of simple demos for you. So over here in Management Studio, I'm running this against 2019. I've got a couple of different scripts. And the first one is uh, waiting tasks. And this is using DMOS waiting tasks. And you can see I, jo I am joining up with a whole bunch of other DMVs to be able to see what's going on. And I've got DMOS wait stats script. And this is basically ordering all of the weights and giving us the top 95% ordered by percentage of all the wait time on this instance descending. And you can see I said there's a list of weights that generally filter out. And you can see my list here of weights that I've collected over time that I've found out to be generally not a problem. Okay. Now there's one here, CX Consumer, where there's controversy about it. Some people say it's not a problem. Some people say it's, it's, uh, it could be a problem. Uh, it's a kind of it depends thing. If you have a lot of parallel queries running on your server, you might comment this out so that you can see where the CX consumer is showing that you've got some kind of parallelism issue. But as a general point, I have this in my list of, of things to filter out and I focus on CX packet weights instead. So let's get an actual demo going. So what I've got here is a script that's gonna set up an insert hotspot. And so it's just creating a simple database and a table with a clustered index and a single int identity column. And so I'm going to run all of this. And then over here, I'm going to hit add 200 clients. And that's going to kick off 200 clients. 
all running against my server. And so there's going to be a lot of contention. All of them are trying to just insert into that single table. So if I go over to DMOS waiting tasks now, and I run my script, we can see that we've got some contention. Now, that's not what the one I want. There we go. That's exactly what I want to show you. So here's what my DMV is showing. It shows us the SPID. It shows us the thread ID within that SPID. And when there's no parallelism, there's uh, it's just thread ID zero. Which scheduler that thread's on, how long the thread's been waiting so far, the wait type, and you can see that there's lots of page latch EX, okay, all waiting for the same resource description. And so this is database ID 10, file number one, page ID 679. And if you look for a blog post of mine called finding a table name for a page ID, that's going to explain how to use a command called dbcc page to figure out what table and index that is from, that page is from. Now, if, if there's parallelism, my script is going to show you the degree of parallelism and which node in the, sorry, if it's CX packet weight, it'll show you which node in the query plan is generating the CX packet weights so that you can go and see what's going on. Now, the DBID, be careful of this. This is the database ID in whose context the query is running, not necessarily the database ID that's being affected. And I deliberately set this up. So my hotspot database is database ID 10, but my clients all say use master and then do three-part naming to get into the hotspot database. So this is why this shows up as database ID 1, which is master. And then the script gives you a URL. This is a URL automatically generated, taking you into the, the web page that I have on my weights library that shows you what page latch EX means. And then a graphical query plan, and then the last text that was executed. So we can see that we have a pattern here. This is a classic pattern showing an insert hotspot, where you've got multiple threads all waiting for the same page. Okay. Now, if we look at wait stats, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clear out the wait stats using dbcc sql perf and then i'm going to run my script and so we can see let's let it run for a little bit we can see that page latch ex is the top weight on the system now from just this information the average wait time here these are the totals these three this is the weight count this is the percentage of all the weights after we filtered out some of those benign ones and then this is the average wait time in seconds Okay. And you can slice and dice this however you want. The, uh, there'll be a zip file with the, all these scripts on the SQL Bits website. So this is in seconds. So this is actually, this one here is 5.8 milliseconds. So we're seeing that every latch weight is 5.8 milliseconds. That doesn't sound like very much. So we might not identify page latch weights as a problem just from looking at weight stats. But from waiting tasks, we see that there is a problem. Okay, so this is why this is the script that I run first rather than wait stats. Now, if we run this, I'll execute this maybe once a second. If you look at the wait count for page latch EX, you can see that it's going up by 30, 40, 50,000 every second. That is something that I would want to investigate because that's a very large number of page latch waits that's happening. So there you can simply see how to use those two scripts. Okay. If we go back over here and make a small change, what I'm doing here is I'm turning off the ability to use row locks. So now every access to insert into this table is going to have to get an exclusive page lock. If we look at waiting tasks, now we see that we've got lock mode X for all the same page. So now we've got a locking issue. Now, all of these locks waiting for the same page, that is a, a, a blocking problem. That is a locking problem. So again, I'd want to go and find out what this page is and why exclusive page locks are being taken rather than intent exclusive page locks. And it could be a variety of different things. If we look at wait stats over here, the reason I've got two of these scripts is so that I can compare and contrast before and after when I do a demo. If I execute this, we can see lock mode X 
almost 100% of all the weights on the server are lock mode X, 22, 23 milliseconds for each weight. That is an instant red flag for me, and I'd want to find out what's going on. So in this case, from either using DMOS weight stats or DMOS weighting tasks, I can see that there's a problem. In the previous case, it was way more obvious using DMOS weighting tasks than DMOS weight stats that I had a problem. Okay, so let's stop that and go back and do a few more slides. So the right log weight, very, very common weight type to see. And this means that there is a transaction, a buffer holding a transaction log block being written to disk. Okay. Every time a transaction commits, unless you're using delayed durability that was added in 2014, the log block containing the commit transaction log record will end and will be flushed to disk. As things go along through the transaction log, as log blocks fill up to a maximum of 60 kilobytes, they'll be flushed to disk. Now, just because you're seeing write log weights doesn't mean you've got a problem. In fact, if you've got anything that's changing stuff on disk uh, in the data files, you're going to see write log weights, unless they're in memory tables. But for regular tables, you're going to see write log weights. So what you need to do, and I haven't mentioned this before, is when your workload is running well and you don't have any problems, you establish a baseline. So you know what the weights look like when there's actually a problem. So when there's a problem, you can go back to your baseline and see how is it, how is what I'm seeing now differing from what's in my baseline. So don't go adding extra transaction log files. That is not going to help you in any way whatsoever. SQL Server does not write in parallel to log files. If you have multiple log files, it will use them sequentially in a loop. Okay. So things you could look at. You could look to see, is the average write log wait time in my IO subsystem the, the same or lower than the write log wait time itself? It could be lower because there might be time, wait time in that write log wait that's to do with contention in the logging system inside SQL Server itself. Okay. It could be that you've got lots of, lots of very tiny transactions, and so every time one of those transactions commits is a write log wait. And you might be able to speed up your workload if some of those transactions don't have to be durable on disk immediately. So you could set some up using deferred durability. You could set uh, important transactions delayed to not be delayed durable and lots of little tiny transactions to be delayed durable so that they don't have to wait for write log waits. And so that's going to speed up your workload. If you're seeing that the average disk write queue length for your log drive is something like 31, 32 all the time, that's an architectural limit in instances before SQL Server 2012, where the, the total outstanding number of transaction log writes for a single database was capped at 32. In 2012 and higher, that was raised up to 1012. So if you're on a really old system, you might have just hit a, a bottleneck. And the only thing you can do is you can upgrade to, to 2012 or higher. Well, don't upgrade to 2012, upgrade to like 2017, 2019, something like that. So different things you could do for write log weights. Um, if your IO subsystem is running slowly and it just can't keep up, you could obviously move the log to a faster portion of the IO subsystem. The next one is very much easier said than done. Increase the size of your transactions. It's almost impossible to do that. You could have a lot of log writes that are happening that don't need to. You could have lots of unused non-clustered indexes, for instance, in a heavily uh, changing database or heavily changing table. And every time a table insert happens, it has to insert into one of those non-clustered indexes. You could have a lot of sequence objects that you're using, and somebody may have set the cache size incorrectly. The cache size means, if let's say your cache size is 50, every 50 times you get the next sequence for a sequence object, it writes to disk. If you set the cache size to one, every time somebody gets a sequence object next number, it's gonna to write to disk. You could have lots of page splits going on, okay? You could have um, a database that's so busy, you, you Delayed durability is not something you could do. You might have to move it to in-memory OLTP right, to try to remove write log weights altogether. So there's all kinds of different things you can do for, for write log weights. Parallelism. So CX packet is a very misunderstood weight type. 
And what CX packet means is you've got parallelism happening. If they're accumulating very fast, it could imply that you've got what's called skewed parallelism. And so this is one of the things I'm going to show you how to look for. Now, don't knee-jerk and say, oh, CX packet weights are horrible, I have to set max DOP to 1, because that turns off parallelism, and that's one of the, the big go-faster things that SQL Server has. Investigate what's going on with your parallelism. Okay? Remember I mentioned earlier on, if you've got CX packet weights and lots of page read weights, that could be a large parallel table scan, so some, some plan changes happened. Okay? Look at the query plans that are causing CX packet weights. They're running in parallel. Does it make sense for your workload for that query to be running in parallel? Okay, it could be that you need to make that query not run in parallel. Then you can use DMOS waiting tasks to look for, are there any non-zero ID threads showing CX packet weights? And that's a sign of skewed parallelism. And I'm going to show you that. So here's an example. Here's a table being scanned. And let's say we're running DOP4. So there's the kind of master controlling thread, all kinds of different names for it, that's thread zero. And then threads one, two, three, and four are actually doing the work. The statistics for this table are up to date. And so the division of work between the threads is accurate. And so that's how long it takes each of those threads to read their portion of the table. Now, if we pull all those back together, then they all take the same time. The control thread, though, for want of a better word, is going to register a CX packet weight for that length of time. In this example, the CX packet weight just says there's parallelism happening. And do you want that to happen or not? Now let's look at a skewed example. Here's our table being scanned again, but a lot more data has been added and the stats haven't been updated. So we're running DOP4 and the four threads are given some work to do. Now look at this. Thread number four has a lot more time so pulling those all back together, threads one, two, and three complete before thread four does. If they complete a long time before, in, in kind of milliseconds, microseconds time, before thread four completes, they are also going to register a CX packet wait because they're waiting for their kind of sister brother thread to finish as well. And that, when you have non-zero thread IDs, registering CX packet wait means that there's a skewed distribution of work. Okay. So CX packet weight could just be parallelism, and it could be something that's causing skewed parallelism. Now, if you find that there's actually a problem, if it's skewed parallelism, then do whatever you need to do to make the estimation of the number of rows correct. Okay? If you don't want parallelism to occur, you could use MaxDOP for a query, or you could use MaxDOP for a database, or you could use Resource Governor to limit the MaxDOP. You could also use MaxDOP for the instance. Now, there's, there's guidelines from Microsoft on a starting point for MaxDOP. And there's the two lines there. These are basically taken from books online that says if you've got NUMA, then it's a certain calculation. If you've got non-NUMA, then it's a certain calculation, up to a, um, a recommended maximum. Your mileage may vary. Right? Because your particular workload, your particular server, your particular NUMA configuration may mean that there's a, a different max DOP that works better for you. So you're going to experiment to see what works for you. So another thing you could do is to avoid parallelism is set the cost threshold for parallelism. Uh, by default, it's set to five. And this means that a, pa a plan will not be parallel until the cost is higher than five. Now, that's a pretty low number. And it, it's not a good number for many instances. So you could experiment to, to see what a better cost threshold for parallelism is for you to stop little tiny things from going in parallel. And there's all kinds of guidance out there saying you should set it to X. And I don't like that guidance because there is no X that's valid for everybody. And I've seen people follow various guidance out there and have issues. So what I'd like you to do is experiment with various different numbers, and it could be 20, 25, 40, 50, what works for your instance, okay, to help avoid those parallel plans. Now let's have a look at some parallelism. So if you're going to do this, you're going to need to run setup parallelism that creates a database with the data structures that I'm going to be using. Now in this parallelism test, what I'm going to do is I've got a table with a thousand columns and I'm going to read everything in that table and I'm do basically doing a select top 10 
from my, my table ordered by randomly generated column name. Okay. And I'm going to use max stop eight and then wait for a half a second and run that in a loop. And I'm reading that into variables. So there's absolutely no output that's going to skew my results. So if I kick that off and then let's zero out the weight stats here. and see how our weights are doing. So we've got CX packet weights and we're seeing 79 milliseconds for each of those weights. Okay. Now if we look at weighting tasks, perfect. So here's an example of CX packet weight. So we're seeing thread zero with a CX packet weight. That's perfectly normal. Okay. It's blocking itself. That's by design that it's showing that it's normal. And we can see it's node ID one in our query plan. So we could look at our graphical query plan, hover over each one of them and see which one is node ID one. And then we're running DOP eight. Perfect. And here we see some of the other threads, some of the eight threads that have been created to run this query waiting for a latch. And they're not all going to be waiting for the latch. It just depends what the threads are doing. And this latch here, access methods, data set parent is a data structure around parallel scans saying, what do I go look at next? Okay, so these two threads are waiting for access. So one of the other eight threads at this point has this latch in exclusive mode and these two threads are waiting for it. So let's say that we don't like those CX packet weights. So I'm going to stop my query and I'm going to change to DOP2. I'm going to knee jerk and reduce the parallelism. Now, before I do that, I had set statistics time on, and we can see that each one of these queries is, what's this, about a thousand milliseconds. If I run this with DOP2 now, Now I've gone up to 1700, 1800 milliseconds for each one. So by reducing the degree of parallelism, I've actually had a detrimental effect on my workload. If we look at weight stats again, CX packet weights are now 570 milliseconds each rather than 79 milliseconds each. So knee jerking when you've got parallelism and trying to reduce it by setting max DOP is generally not a good thing to do. Figure out whether you want parallelism in the first place, figure out whether it's skewed. Now let's have a look at skewed parallelism. So here, what I'm doing is I'm going to set this database up. I'm not showing you what I'm doing and I'm going to run five queries. And let's look and see what's going on with DMOS waiting tasks. So here we see skewed parallelism. Look at this. So just using SPID64 as an example, we've got our CX packet weight for our thread ID zero as we should have, but now we've got other threads inside the query also waiting for CX packet weight. That is a sign of skewed parallelism. So what's my query actually doing? If I turn on, include my actual execution plan and I run it, if I look at the execution plan and I hover over my clustered index scan here and go to properties, look at this. So the actual number of rows, 2048, the estimated number down at the bottom, 10 million. So it spun up eight threads, gave each one a range of 1.125 million to, or 1.25 million to read and then said go. Now, all the threads apart from thread ID six had nothing to do, but thread ID six had 2048 rows to scan. So all the other threads were waiting for thread ID six. That is skewed parallelism. And the way that I engineered that very simple was I said, I created my, my table and said update stats and pretend we have 10 million rows in a million pages. Okay. So let's stop that. So going back to the slides, a couple more quick ones, async network IO, the word that people fixate on in there is network. Okay. 
most often it's not a network wait. It's either the client code is processing rows really inefficiently, doing what's called rebar row by agonizing row. It could be using multiple active result sets. It could also be that the client's application server is running slowly. And so the client code itself is running slowly because the client server is running slowly. Async network IO means SQL Server has sent a packet of information to the client and is waiting for the client to come back and say, okay, give me more. So it's very commonly not a networking issue. If you look at these client code issues and it's not that, then it could be an actual network issue. So go check those out. OLEDB we've already talked about. It's most likely, uh, if you've got little tiny weights, it could be uh, CheckDB, it could be DMVs, it could be your third-party monitoring tool. If it's a large, long wait, like tens, hundreds of milliseconds, it could be something like performance of a linked server. So to summarize the methodology, gather some information about the performance problem itself. So ask the, the people, um, how long have you been seeing the problem? What did you change? And they might say, I don't know, and we didn't change anything. Have a look at DMOS waiting tasks, and that might show you a pattern. Have a look at DMOS wait stats, especially if they have a, a series of snapshots, you'll be able to kind of figure out what's going on. Look at the top three or four relevant waits, because they're the, the, the biggest issues on the server. If they have a baseline, compare it with the baseline so you can see how is it different from, from what's been there in the past. And then drill in from there. Understand what the weight types are and then drill in. Avoid knee jerking. So here's some resources for you. There's a link to the weight types library. There's a bunch of white papers that are relevant. I've blogged an awful lot about this and I have a, a long course that you can get to on Pluralsight as well. So we're done. Many thanks for watching my session and I hope you enjoyed it and learned from it. If you have any questions about the content, please feel free to email me at paul at I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and bye for now.